Dr. Hackbrass has authored, co-authored, and edited, you know, again, a shelf of books. A shelf of books, including titles such as The Case for the Resurrection, Beyond Death, and Dealing with Doubt. He has spoken uh, widely at various universities, colleges, and seminaries, including uh, Stanford, Oxford, Cambridge, and he's lectured a number of times for us at Biola University. Our students remember him and love him dearly. Clearly, he is one of the world authorities on the topic of the historical <coughs> Jesus and the resurrection, and his topic tonight is Resurrection, Evidence that Changed a Generation of Scholarship, Dr. Gary Hackman. Turned the rest of the exam in blank. 
So he got like an 18 or something. <laughs> <laughs> that same school that I was teaching at in Montana, they put a skit on one night, and it was kind of a spoof on professors. And my son, who was just a little tiny guy at that time, uh, they said in the skit, not a true story, but they said, yeah, we saw Rob walking down the street. And we said to Rob, Rob, oh, beautiful day, isn't it? And Rob said, what does that have to do with the resurrection? <laughs> so you know my kids are getting around the house. Well, the resurrection is just that central. And with the resurrection, I think Paul says this, 1 Corinthians 15, 12 through 20. With the resurrection, we have everything in Christianity. Without the resurrection, we don't have Christianity. It's all or nothing. And that's what I'm going to talk to you about tonight. I'm going to talk about evidencing the resurrection. And I'm going to talk about a method that I worked on, developed, whatever, in my PhD dissertation in Michigan State. I have to stop to think where I am before I say Michigan State. We're playing the Buckeyes tomorrow, so this is, uh, I had, my, had made sure my wife takes it today. Go Spartans. Go uh, Green. Go Green. <laughs> Thank you. Now I'm in a better mood. Uh, oh, I don't think we're going to win. Uh, so I was in Michigan State, and about half my committee thought the resurrection was, uh, had a good chance of being true, and the other half of my committee definitely did not believe it. And the person that was the most complimentary of my dissertation was a Jewish history professor. And I had to satisfy my dissertation, I had to satisfy the history department, religion, and philosophy, because my degree was in history, philosophy, and religion. <laughs> And as, the, as I left the meeting where my topic was approved, the head of the program, who did not believe the resurrection, said to me, so I don't, I don't care if you do the resurrection. He said, you know, we're pretty liberal around here, but we're liberal in the good sense. We don't care what you do as long as it's defensible. We don't care what side you come down on, conservative, liberal, whatever. Just do it for a reason. And he said, therefore, don't tell us the resurrection happened because the Bible said it happened. And he started to walk away like, have a good day. And, and I thought, don't tell me it happened because the Bible said it happened. Now, I'm going to explain probably the most important single point in the minimal facts argument that... I kind of molded around his challenge that day. And the minimal facts argument, people don't understand this point. I would say on college campuses, at secular groups, I would say, I'm not going to assume the Bible's inspired. Because for my purposes, if it isn't, it doesn't make any difference from my argument. But I'm not even going to uh, assume the Bible's reliable. Because if the Bible is unreliable, you can still get this argument. So I call this argument the heads I win, tails you lose argument. <laughs> and I say this on campus all the time, and anymore it's kind of a neat thing when I go to state universities. I'm often co-sponsored by a Christian group on campus and a free thinkers group on campus. They both sponsor me. They've both been given flyers out. In fact, I was at the University of Iowa a few months ago. And the other side had t-shirts on, University of Iowa Atheists. And they helped pass the, the uh, brochures on. Now, they didn't know this that night. But one of their faculty sponsors is a well-known skeptic, Evan Fails. He's a very well-known philosopher. And that night, I ended up having dinner with Evan. And he and I hit it off just incredibly. You would have thought we were Vietnamese buddies. I mean, we were laughing and cutting up and joking around by the end of the night. And after I gave the lecture, same one I'm going to give here, um, I said, Evan, he sat in the front row right about there. I said, Evan, why don't you come on up afterwards and you can have ten minutes to respond to my lecture. I won't even talk. And then you and I can dialogue up here in front. He said, I'll do it. And the atheist part of the group that was sponsored me, they were just so impressed. And people heard them before in the meeting, and they were saying, they asked Evan if he wanted to come up. They're going to give Evan a slot up here. And they were just, they just thought it was so cool that we would give them a say 
There were like 800 people there for this thing. And uh, we dialogued. It was over. We had a photo shoot. It was hilarious because he would like hang on my shoulder and make faces. And it was a great time. But I truly believe that if you're going to minister and use something and take it, you can catch more flies with sugar or honey than you can with vinegar. And so I try to befriend the folks that I chat with. And so he knows this argument, and I use this. I use them for the dissertation. And the point is, when I say this, when I say I'm only going to use verses which critics allow, I'm only going to use texts, and then I say I'm going to go to 1 Corinthians 15. Here's the response from folks who don't understand what I just said. And they're usually the mythicists. Um, I can stop here and say something about mythicists, but I, I won't do it. Um, I'm, I'm really biting my tongue. Uh, but they think I'm doing a bait and switch. They think I'm saying, I'm going to give you evidence for the resurrection. All right, let's turn to the Bible. So they go, I'm, I feel cheated. I feel cheated. Why? Because you act like you're not going to use the Bible, and then you do. No, they just understood, misunderstood the whole argument. My committee at Michigan State, they did not care if I used the New Testament. So what about what your advisor said? You can you uh, uh, just don't tell us it happened because the Bible said it happened. That's the key. Don't quote verses and say that settles it. You can use all the verses you want, but only use verses that follow and are and satisfy critical principles. If you go to Bart Ehrman's works, best known critic in North America, if you go to Bart Ehrman's works, if you don't cite verses, he will. He'll use more verses than you use. So here's the difference. You may cite them because they're in your book and you believe your book's inspired. That's fine. But he cites them because they stand criticism from applying rules to the text, critical rules. So I'm only going to use two texts tonight. Virtually every scholar now not people who call themselves scholars who aren't, and they're writing blogs from their parents' basement. And um, all of a sudden, because they got a blog, they'll tell you they're published authors. <laughs> Folks, you know how common this is. And then there's a lot of anger that goes along with it, too. Since they don't have arguments that refute your arguments, you present arguments, they present anger. Um, they don't understand the argument. Critics, Bart Ehrman, will let me use the text I'm using tonight. I'm only going to use 1 Corinthians chapter 15. And the end of Galatians 1, beginning of Galatians 2. Now remember, there's no chapter dividings in the originals. I'm not talking about Psalms and so on, but the New Testament text, there's no chapter dividings. So the end of Galatians 1, end of Galatians 2, just a little stretch right there. And 1 Corinthians 15, just the first 11 verses. Both of these are geared or called by scholars the authentic. Pauline epistles, or as Bart Ehrman calls them, the undisputed Pauline epistles. Now, how many of Paul's epistles, in case you're interested, this would be a footnote, how many of Paul's epistles are undisputed? Well, of the 13 books that bear his name, seven of them are granted by everybody, scholars, no matter how critical they are. No matter how critical, Bart Ehrman will give you all seven books. G. A. Wells, by the way, who may be the best known of the mythicists, will give you eight books, and they're the same seven plus one more. Critics don't just give seven of Paul's books; they give the same seven, and that's important. And if you're if you're here and you're a pastor and you decide to preach on Paul, they're probably going to be the books you choose from Paul because they're the most generally thought to be the most important Pauline epistles. Here's the seven authentic epistles. Romans, 1st and 2nd Corinthians, Galatians, I'll repeat them, so, Philippians, 1st Thessalonians, and Philemon. Okay, one more time. Romans, 1st and 2nd Corinthians, Galatians, Philippians, 1st Thessalonians, Philemon. Now, in case you wonder, G.A. Wells, the mythicist, he'll give you Colossians too. 
So that makes eight. But everyone grants the seven. Now, what do I mean when I say they grant seven? What do they think? They don't think those books are inspired, do they? No way. Do they think they're reliable? Not usually. <coughs> what are they then? I think probably the best word would be authoritative. What's authoritative mean? Well, let's think about this. We know the author. Now, they'll usually say, unlike the gospel, because most critics will say we don't know the authors of the four gospels. That's another matter. But they'll say we know who wrote these seven books. We know the guy is very well trained. He's a scholar. He is honest. It's obvious from his writings he has a moral code and creed. He's honest. And he might be wrong about something, but he won't knowingly lie. He will tell you what he believes is true. And this may be the most important point. He has been with the original eyewitnesses who walked and talked with Jesus to the whole ministry. That's why Paul is so important. That's the sense of which is authoritative. And they will say he's the closest, critics will say he's the closest we have to Jesus himself. Because again, we don't, they, they'll say that we don't know the author of the four Gospels. Paul's books are also the earliest. Now, James might be a little bit earlier, the Epistle of James. The Galatians and James might be about the earliest at about 48. But for the most part, Paul's epistles are the earliest. So earliest to most authoritative. Now, I'm going to use those two texts tonight. In order to do the minimal facts argument, I'm going to use only facts that pass two rules. The first one is by far the most important. The second one is just convenient. In fact, there are two ever changes. One is plenty to pull this off. Reason number one, I will use no fact tonight that is not multiply evidenced from different angles. You say, well, like how many different angles? Well, let me give you an example. Bart Ehrman, of all people, you know one of the most important rules to establish a New Testament text is independent attestation. How many sources do you have that report this? In the ancient world, as Paul Meyer, professor, well, retired now, emeritus professor of ancient history at Western Michigan University, as Paul Meyer says, in the ancient world, two sources often make a, are often enough to prove an event. Two, in the ancient world. Bart Ehrman, just doing multiple attestation, not all the other evidences you might have, but just on multiple attestation, Bart Ehrman, best known critic, lists 12 independent sources for the crucifixion of Jesus. 12. I'm working on a magnum opus on the resurrection. Uh, I'm projecting this thing at 3,500 pages, three huge volumes, I've written 800 pages. I've got another thousand that are written, but they have to be edited. So that's about half the book, half the three books. And I just finished this section on the evidence for the crucifixion of Jesus. Evidence for the crucifixion. The material is just under 100 pages long. That's how much data we have for the crucifixion. And why scholars like John Dominic Crossan and, uh, well, I'll just name a couple. John Dominic Crossan, I'll, I'll pick on Berman again, or we can use the British scholar Morris Casey, who's another agnostic. James Crossley, another agnostic, they would say it's probably the best attested fact in the New Testament. 100 pages of evidence. That's how solid it is. Now, crucifixion doesn't prove resurrection, obviously, but it's a prerequisite for resurrection. So we need it. I'm going to start there tonight, in just a minute. I'm going to spend the rest of the night walking off the timeline here, and crucifixion is going to be down there. So. How many of you have seen this timeline lecture before, either online or in front? Okay, a lot of you. How many of you have seen this more than once? A lot of you. Anybody seen it more than three times? A lot of you. Okay. Why are you here? Love <laughs> you. Ah, thank you. Thank you. What, what is your name? Pardon? Todd. 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 You know what? I am deaf. Todd. 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 Nice to meet you, Todd. 
I have literally, I have literally lost 75% of my hearing. So my wife told me a hundred times, don't go out of the house without your hearing aid. <laughs> I have to only put it in one ear because this ear doesn't work whether it's a hearing aid or not. My dad said I should fill it with cement and ignore it. <laughs> I walked out of the house. I brought a spare battery, but left the hearing aid on the table. <laughs> We sat down, and I'm asking how many of you have heard this. Tom Seth was already sitting here when I sat down. He said, are you in the timeline lecture? And I said, I am. He goes, good. I love that thing. In fact, I've given that lecture before. <laughs> so that's what we want to do. There's nothing difficult in this lecture. It's just a penal history. It's just that there's a lot of data. But you can give it to anybody. I have given this lecture to as young as 11 year olds, a class of 11 year olds. Get into a class of 14 year olds. And I gave a Shroud of Turin lecture, which is, you know, close, to second graders one time. And of course, they paid attention because all the photographs were bloody. <laughs> so they thought it was cool. All right, so that's the first principle. We'll only use data that's multiply evidence. The second one is, because it's multiple evidence, think about the topic tonight, the resurrection evidence that changed your generation. The second one is critics. A very high percentage of critical scholars will allow all of my facts. They'll allow them. Well, how do you know? I love it when skeptics do that in universities. But how do you know? And I'll say, I counted. Have you? <laughs> Years ago, I started with a list of 1975 to date, all the important resurrection books. My bibliography is 3,500 sources long. I went through about 2,000 of them in detail. I took notes on where scholars were on 140 subtopics on death, burial, resurrection, and then notes on where scholarship alone is are 1,200 pages long. I'm just saying there's a lot of data out there, but I know head count. I know about where, pe where people are percentage-wise. And so the second principle is most scholars will agree with you. What percentage? Well, I'm going to use just a half dozen facts approximately tonight. And 90-some percent of scholars agree with them. The main ones I'm going to use, the fact that there was a crucifixion and that the disciples thought they saw Jesus alive after his death, those two are probably the most widely allowed facts in the New Testament. And I would say the percentage of admittance among critics is between 95 and 99 percent. So my argument is each fact is attested by multiple evidences, and that's why the critics allow it. Now let's say starting tomorrow, critics don't grant it anymore. They're tired of allowing it, and people keep getting them in the corner because they allow the data. And they go, I don't allow it anymore. Bart Ehrman just recently changed his view on the MP2. He used to allow the MP2. He was starting to admit too many things. And so in his last book, he tells you why he changed his mind. Let's say they all start changing their mind. The first reason is the most important. I will only use facts that are multiply evidenced from a number of different angles. All right? One more illustration, and I'm going to start on the timeline. Uh, two summers ago, I was dialoguing with James Crossley. <coughs> James Crossley is an agnostic New Testament professor. He calls himself an agnostic unbeliever. He says, belief-wise, he's about exactly where Bart Ehrman is in the States. He's very well known in England. By the way, he's an agnostic. You know when he dates the Gospel of Mark? He did, his, he did his dissertation on this. He dates the Gospel of Mark to about 40 AD. His mentor, Morris Casey, dates Mark to 40 AD for totally different reasons than James Crossley does. So there's two sets of reasons for 40 AD. And Crossley puts Matthew at 50 to 60 AD. They predate evangelical dates. So we started the dialogue and the moderator said that they would have, we did two short dialogues. The first one was called The Minimal Facts Evidence of the Resurrection of Jesus. And by the way, this is on the Unbelievable program. You can get them online. We are both live in the London studio. And Justin Bryan said, you know, the minimal facts. 
indicate the resurrection occurred. He said, Gary, how many facts you can use today? I said, I'm going to use six. I changed the numbers because critics will give you more than the number I use. So I'll just play musical chairs and depending on who I'm talking to, I'll take different facts. As long as they're from this group, we'll all attest to ones. He said, okay, six, go ahead. I named the six. I didn't even give any evidence. He said, okay. He said, James, what do you think? And just like this, James Crossley said, I'll concede all six of them, no dispute. He said, okay. And then Justin, the moderator, said, okay, good, good way to start. And James said, can I say one more thing? And Justin said, sure. And he said, these are not just well-attested facts. These are the best attested facts in the New Testament. So that's the note we started on. Now let's see what you get from this. Okay? Only use facts that are well attested by multiple evidences, and because of that, virtually everybody agrees. Let's start down here. Now this is creation down here. This is crucifixion. Down there is 2016. And in between, for the most part, and first of all, I'll do a little more uh, data here, but for the most part, my line is only going to go about 25 years. Alright? Okay, so Jesus dies approximately 30 AD. 30 AD is a great year. It's the most popular year. Probably think it's a nice round number. Scholars don't, don't give a date real often, because it's kind of irrelevant to them. The next most popular year is not 29 or 31. The next most popular year is 33. She had to get the moon right for Passover and everything. And you have to ask how many times this happened in April and what years are they. And so on. It's like 27, 30, 33. Alright. So Jesus dies about 30 AD. I'm going to call this ground zero because we're going to go plus and minus. Well, not minus. We're going plus from this point. Okay. Now, if you ask the average Christian, what's the evidence for that event? And they're going to say, well, we've got the Gospel of Mark. Now, I'm going to use critical dating, okay, to show you that doesn't really make any difference if you use the critics' dates or evangelical dates. They're going to be either very close to the same or only a few years later, not enough to change anything. And if you go with the critics' dates, Mark said about 70 AD, or plus what? 40. Plus one, plus 40. Plus 40, great for ancient history. 40 years, super. They put Matthew at about 80, or plus 50, 50. Or Luke at about 85, or how much? Plus 55. And everybody puts John at about 95, or how many years? 65. Now, you can stop right there. And 65 years is fine for historicity. I mean, even in modern times. I remember hearing about a man who was doing his memoirs of World War II, and it was in the early 90s. That would be 50 years after the fact. That would be right about where Matthew or Luke are. That's fine. No one's going to say, you're a liar. Nobody can remember things for 50 years. I won't embarrass anybody here, but how many can remember things from 50 years ago? And you know the crazy thing about some of them who raise their hand, they're not even 50. <laughs> okay. No problem remembering things from 50 years ago. It's not an issue. In fact, Far Ehrman, when he lists sources for the historical Jesus, do you know how far he goes? 100 years. He goes from 30 AD to 130 AD. Well, guess what? All four Gospels are in there. Now, we could give reasons for this, but that would be the reliability argument. That's the other way that evangelicals argue for uh, the Gospels, and let me get more to the New Testament. And let me just say, I have no problem with the reliability argument. I don't think it's as strong, but I think it's a good argument. And it complements a minimal facts argument. A reliability argument is a top-down argument. 
It goes like this. The reliability argument basically says, if this is a reliable book, I can basically trust everything in it. Minimal fact says, we won't spread the, you know, we won't put the roof out there quite that broadly to catch everything underneath it. We're going to build from the bottom up one fact at a time. So if the minimal, if the reliability argument is kind of a roof spread over the facts argument, the minimal facts argument is a brick wall built one brick at a time from the bottom up, with every brick being a fact. If you want two illustrations of what I'm doing. The bar argument goes 100 years, so we're fine. Now, I debated a, a pretty well-known atheist, by the way, last summer I had two rounds with uh, Michael Roos, very well-known atheist, but a few years ago, I was dialoguing with Vic Stinger. He's deceased now, but you might know Vic Stinger, pretty well-known atheist. And we were dialoguing, and we're in the dialogue part, and he got to speak before we had two lecterns up here, and we're about 15 feet away, and he said, he said, the Gospels are lousy sources. They can't be believed. They're way too late after the events they report. And it, it bugs me. I get kind of steamed a little bit when people say things. I don't think he was saying anything that he thought was false. He probably thought it was true. But it bugs me when people give false data and speak like it's true. Especially because there were about 500 there. It was at uh, New Orleans Baptist Seminary. It was on a Saturday. And a lot of those guys are seminary students. And I know what happens to people when they have grounds for doubts. I've written three books on doubt and you know, know what happens. And, and I, I can't stand someone saying something. So it was my turn to say something that's not true. So I, when it was my chance, I said, so the Gospels are too late, right? He said, yeah, they're too late. Can't be much truer, can there? Not can't be much truer. So what do you think about Alexander the Great? Yeah, good source. Well, how much do we know about Alexander? A lot. Do you? Yeah, a lot. Do you have any idea how long Alexander comes after the sources come after his death? No, nope, he didn't know. Yeah, well, don't debate. You don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> If this is Alexander's death from about 320 AD, here's the earliest. There are earlier written sources, but we don't have them. Here's the earliest source, and I don't mean a description in a rock, I mean a good sized text. Here's the earliest source for Alexander's death on this timeline. Earliest source. Now, Mark, we know it's too late. We know he's too late. He's too late. John's too late. But Alexander, he's special. <laughs> I'll get back to the front. Sir. The first source for Alexander, one time I went off the side door, <laughs> the door locked. <laughs> I can bait on me back into the sanctuary. The earliest source for Alexander is just under 300 years. But everybody knows the Gospels are way too late to be good. But I like Alexander. And here's the comeback right away. Skeptics say, yeah, but there's a problem. Difference. You think the Gospels are history. They're not. They're religious propaganda. How do you know? Because they report miracles. And I'll say, well, wow, I'm sure glad Alexander is straight history. Because here's how Plutarch's Alexander starts. It's commonly believed that Alexander was the son of a god. <laughs> and his mother was a virgin. I'm, I'm glad we're not. So now we're not only doing 300 years later, we're doing theology for Alexander. And I said almost 300, it's about 280 for the earliest source for Alexander. The best sources for Alexander, Plutarch and Arian, plus four and a quarter to 450. Four and a quarter to 
450. That is 10 times the difference between Mark and Jesus. 10 times. But it's good. Gospels are lousy. Okay. Well, I, I believe this argument can be developed, but I'm going to do a different one tonight. And this is a normal facts argument. I'm going to go over on this side of the line. Because if this is Mark at 70, I'm going to start with Paul at 55. Or, plus what? 25 years. 1 Corinthians 15, chapter 5, 1 Corinthians 15, verses 3 and following. Well, let me back up. First two verses. Paul says, When I came to you, Corinthians, now, he writes the book here. The date he comes to Corinth may be the strongest attested date in the New Testament. And he comes to Corinth about 51 AD. You know how we know? New Testament tells us who is, we call him the mayor, who's the head of the city of Corinth. And now we found an inscription in Iraq that we know when he was the mayor, and they're only there for one year terms. And he was mayor from 51 to 52 AD. All right, so Paul says, when I came to you guys, I gave you the gospel. Footnote. Whenever the gospel, the factual side of the gospel, is given in the New Testament. It's mostly in the writings of Paul, the epistles of Paul, the book of Acts. There's always at least three historical facts mentioned as part of the gospel. The deity, death, and resurrection of Jesus. Deity, death, resurrection. Deity, death, resurrection. Without that, you don't have the gospel. Deity, death, resurrection. A lot of Christians like to say, death, burial, resurrection. Nothing wrong with that. Pharaoh is mentioned a few times in the context, but it's only mentioned uh, comparatively a few times compared to deity. So, well, how do you get deity? How do you get deity? Because titles are used. Here's a great example Romans 10 9. If you confess with your mouth and believe in your heart, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God's raised you from the dead, you shall be saved. Now, notice what's there. Lord. Raised, dead. So, deity, death, resurrection. And what's really cool is three verses later, and verse 13, Paul says, with the mouth we believe, with the heart we believe, he's proclaimed with the mouth. And he quotes Joel, whoever calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. In that text in Joel, you know what the name for God is in the Old Testament? Jehovah. So when he says, confess me about that Jesus is Lord, how much Lord? Jehovah. It's pretty high Christology. Son of God, die for your sins, rose from the dead. Lord, die for your sins, rose from the dead. And there's a the human side. What are you going to do with them? Have you said, I do, to Jesus? I use that phrase because in the West, that's, of all well, many parts of the world, that's the closest we have to a, an affirmation of total commitment. You know the words, better or worse, richer or poor, sickness and death. I mean, I mean, in sickness and health till death do we part. That's commitment. And Paul says, have you done that with Jesus? Now, this one is a doctoral dissertation, but I'll just tell you the conclusion. In the New Testament, there are dozens of passages which are, are early creedal passages, synonyms, almost synonyms, they're not quite synonymous, but almost synonyms would be creeds, traditions, or confessions. And they are the answer to this question. I think it's the most exciting question in the New Testament. Here's the question. Of what did earliest preaching consist between the years of 30 and 50 AD? I think it's the most exciting question. How far back does this resurrection message go? Of what did earliest preaching consist before there was a single New Testament book? Now, 
What do you do when you don't have a New Testament book? Well, it almost doesn't make any difference because most New Testament scholars today believe that up to 90% of Jesus' listeners were illiterate. 90% of Jesus' listeners may have been illiterate. Now, you folks tell me, if someone's illiterate, hey, think of a little child. If someone's illiterate, could they know the words to just as I am? Could they know the words to amazing grace, how sweet the sound? Could they know the words to a little ditty, like Jack and Jill went up the hill to fetch a pail of water, Jack fell down and broke his crown, and Jill came tumbling after And they can't read? But they know the little poem or little whatever. Yeah. They can sing the song? Yeah. That's how they taught in the early church. They did things in short synopses so that people could remember the most important facts even when they couldn't read or write. And there's dozens of these in the New Testament. Paul tells you there's one here. It's 1 Corinthians 15, 3. He said, I delivered unto you that which I also received, and listen to this, as a first importance. I gave you what I received as a first importance. Nothing's more important than this. He says that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. Christ is the title. Was buried, rose again from the dead the third day according to the scriptures, and appeared. And here comes a list of appearances to three individuals, three groups. Now Paul attaches his name to the end. Everybody agrees he adds his name to the end of the list. But he makes the third individual, Peter, James the brother of Jesus, Paul. And three groups. There's the twelve. There's a group called all the apostles. And there's a group which he identifies as the five hundred. And he says five hundred brethren. Like the feeding of the 5,000, which says men, there would have been 8,000 people there if you count women and children. And if he literally means brethren, and not just using the male uh, sense there, it could be 500 men, it could be 800 people at that appearance. So that's, that's good to remember. And Paul goes into this list. All right. Paul says, verse 3, I gave you what I was given. When did Paul receive this material? This is the part I can't unpack for you today. We could, do, we could work on that for a whole lecture or a whole dissertation. But critics, critics, remember the name of lecturers, change of generation? Critics believe today. In fact, there's more than one source that says the consensus New Testament position the consensus New Testament position is that Paul received this material at about plus five. Plus five. Folks, there's like nothing like this in the ancient world. Plus five. This is what Paul hears. Now, how do we know this? Well, now, oftentimes in my lecture, somebody will say to me, I don't remember. Paul comes today. Well, do the math. Flip the Galatians 1, 118. He said, When I met the risen Jesus, I didn't go running right up to Jerusalem to meet those who were apostles before me. But three years later, I did go up. Okay, let's do it. Cross. He meets the Lord. What is this? It usually said that he met the Lord. Here's another way to ask it. How late is Acts 9 after Acts 1? And his conversion is usually placed at plus 2 or plus 3 after the cross. So the first move after the cross, plus 2 or plus 3. Then he says, three years later, I went up to Jerusalem. 2 plus 3, 5. 3 plus 3, 6. Right here, five and a half, five or six years, Paul was up there. He said, I stayed for 15 days. 
And I saw none of the apostles except James, the brother of Jesus, and Peter. How would you like to have been a fly on the wall? Seriously, when Jesus appears to his brother, James, the unbeliever. <coughs> By the way, we talked about multiple attestation. We have multiple attestation for James being an unbeliever. Mark chapter 3, John chapter 6. That's multiple attestation. Now, if it's Matthew, Mark, or Luke, that counts as Mark. If you haven't had this before, you just take a seminary class. We'll tell you the difference. But John is a separate source. So Mark and John are two sources. And they say James is an unbeliever. There's two texts for James. And pretty bad. James and his brothers thought Jesus was nuts. I'm not just making that up. The Greek says they thought he was beside himself. Two minds. He thought the Messiah. Sorry. And then they tried to take him out of the way so he wouldn't embarrass anybody, like his family. Because he was in the hometown in that passage. How did you be there? And James is, I don't know, maybe a carpenter. He's out back and he's working. And Jesus appears. says, bro. <laughs> Check it out. Those are scars. You know who I am? What would you do if you were James? Then he steps forward and he goes, touch me. Give me a hug. Remember the verses in Luke when he later sees the apostles? They said they're terrified or frightened, suppose they've seen a ghost, that's King James. And he said, handle me and see, for a spirit hath not flesh and bones as you see me have. Touch me. Go ahead. Have you know the story of Thomas? Falls on his feet. My Lord and my God. Then there's Peter. He denied his Lord three times. And here's his Lord. Feed my lambs, Peter. I was later at the lake, but here I am. How'd you like to be one of those guys, James or Peter? And he sees him here for, for 15 days. Now, there's a Greek word in this text. Galatians chapter 1, verse 18. The Greek word is hysteresi. Hysteresi. The Greek root word is H-I-S, if you transliterate, right? Greek doesn't have Arabic letters. H-I-S-T-O-R. That's the Greek word from which we get the English word. What? History. Now we can't jump the gun and say because this is the Greek word from which we get the English word history that that means history. But I'll tell you, there's been, that I know of, at least three lengthy word studies done on that, all by non-evangelicals. And here's what they say about the store, the rule word. It means to check something out in person. I would say the best meaning, maybe, for a store is what many of us in our local towns see on the 10 or 11 o'clock news whenever you get it in your area. And so many of them. How many news programs start like this at night? Eyewitness news. <laughs> and you know, the implications are, we're bringing it to you right now. We know it, because we're there. And yes, there's a big hurricane down in Florida, but we got somebody on the scene. It's Geraldo Rivera. He always liked to be in the storm. <laughs> You remember in the old days, you always like to be in the heart of it to show you it's something for you. Okay, that's eyewitness. That's eyewitness news. His store, his side. I was with these fellows, plus five or plus six. And what were they talking about? Don't forget the theme of the book of Galatians. It's only six chapters long. You can take this, the theme in about one sentence. It's all about the gospel. Don't get it wrong. Don't add to it, don't subtract from it. Give it the right way, or it's heresy. You understand? Go. That's it, the gospel. If they're talking about the gospel, they've mentioned the resurrection. And who better to ask about the appearances than James, the brother of Jesus, and Paul? 
By the way, this is quick, but 14 years ago, Paul, 14 years ago, 14 years later, Paul goes back up to Jerusalem, and who's there? James is still there. Peter's still there. And John is there. Of course, not to mention Paul. Why are those four important? James, Peter, Paul, John. Maybe somebody else was present. Could have been Peter, Paul, and Mary. <laughs> Seriously, she was probably there too. But they're there. And what, what, what's so important about these big four? They are by far the most influential Christians in the early church. If you want to go to the most authoritative person in the early church, go to one of those four. Two of them are part of the twelve, Peter and John, and two are later made apostles, James, the brother of Jesus, and Paul, both are believers and skeptics of different sorts. Four. And what are they talking about? Galatians 2 2. I went up 14 years later, critics put this about 48 AD, so about plus 18. I went up about plus 18. I presented to the apostles the gospel I was preaching. Why? To see if I was running or had run in vain. But what? Well, yeah, I just want to make sure we're on the same page. This is why Paul's works are so important and so authoritative. The best thing Paul gives us is that he knew these guys. And he asked them about the resurrection appearances because he set before them the gospel. There's no gospel without resurrection. They had to discuss resurrection. Bart Ehrman says, Paul spent, now he's talking about that one. But he says, Paul spent 14 days, 15 days, with the eyewitnesses. And then Bart says, I'd like to spend 15 days with Peter and Paul. This is it Peter and James. And then Bart Ehrman says this, Where do we get closer to eyewitness testimony in the New Testament than right here? It's the best insider's track if you want to present eyewitness testimony. Because James, John, and Peter said so. Now Paul is a witness too. So that's four eyewitnesses. Alright, end of the argument here. Paul gets this at plus five or plus six. But watch carefully. This is when Paul heard it. This isn't how the creed is. This is when Paul heard it. If he got it from Peter, and James, which is a consensus New Testament position, they had the testimony before he had. And the events on which the testimony is based are earlier still. We're right back to the events themselves. Bar Ehrman, this is why critics call these pre-Pauline creeds. What's a pre-Pauline creed? The earliest of them? What's a pre-Pauline creed? Here's the cross. When's Paul converted? What's pre-Pauline? Right there. That's a pre-Pauline creed. Meaning, it was around when he was saved. Paul didn't invent this message. Paul comes on the scene. It already existed. It's pre-Pauline. Bar Herman dates this material. Several forms of it. New Testament, he probably dates maybe six different forms of it, to one, to one to two years after the cross. You want good data? Plus one or plus two. Go to the critics believe this? Yeah. Our earnings is one to two years. James D.G. Dunn, as influential as any historical Jesus scholar today, James D.G. Dunn says, the latest it could have been formulated into Mary had a little lamb, into that form. He says the earliest, sorry, latest, would be about six months after the cross. Larry Hurtado says, 
days after the cross. Bart Ehrman is actually liberal at one to two years. Jimmy Dunn says six months. Larry Hurtado says days. Now I'll add this. I haven't mentioned naturalistic theories. The critics are trying to come up with naturalistic theories. They all crash and burn on facts I have mentioned in this lecture without going anywhere else. Just these facts alone. Don't be empty tooling here. It's not as well accepted by scholars, probably 75 to 70, 75 percent. I gave a lecture at ETS a few years ago, 21 arguments for the empty tomb. 21, with two sources that are not the established events in the ancient world. What about 21? That's the data we have for the gospel. So let me extend with this. My time's up. Folks, the importance of this text is that, I told you in the New Testament, resurrection mentions almost every area of theology. The doctrine that is connected to the resurrection of Jesus more than any other doctrine is the fact that because Jesus is raised, we will be raised too. Almost 20 times in the New Testament. John says we shall see him as he is and we shall be like him. Paul says he will raise our vile body to be like unto his glorious body. We will see him as he is and we will be like him. Let me stand with this thought. In 1992, I watched my wife die of stomach cancer. By the way, many of you know that Nabil Qureshi has stomach cancer. Please remember in prayer, but if you haven't heard yet, he got an incredible report yesterday from a PET scan <coughs> that most of the cancer has disappeared. Now, whether God's healing, whether he's given him more years, we don't know what's going on. But I know what this is about. He and I had talked about this the other day. I watched my wife die four months after diagnosis from some cancer. And it was also 20 years ago, and things weren't as knowledgeable. Tell me, or tell Michelle, the Beale's wife, tell people who are supposedly losing their loved ones according to the stats. Tell them it doesn't make a difference whether Jesus is raised from the dead or not. The most touching card I got when my wife was sick, I couldn't even repeat the words for a whole year afterwards that said this, what are you going to do when you get to heaven and walk with your wife down the golden streets hand in hand by the river of life. I couldn't even read the words, let alone say them to somebody, because they were so precious to me. That's the difference between the resurrection of Jesus being true and the resurrection of Jesus not being true. If it's our time and we go, we're going to the best place in the world. Paul said Philippians 1:21. And 23. He said it's far better to die and be with Christ. Far better. That's the message we have, folks. We want to live forever. That's the hope of humankind. And it's promised as a by result of the resurrection of Jesus. I leave with you tonight the words of our Lord Jesus Christ Himself, John chapter 14, verse 19, who also said this, because I live. You shall live also.